thanks a lot for uh, the invitation and uh, the opportunity to present. Of course, I cannot see all of you, but I, uh, I, I think I may recognize some names. Uh, so hopefully we'll get a chance in the end to, to interact a little bit through the questions. Um, yeah, I'm sitting at home end of the day, Friday afternoon, not because I'm at home anymore uh, usually, but it's, uh, I guess, one of the benefits that we've learned that we can now actually share these kind of things uh, from everywhere. So it's a pleasure. And uh, the, the title I gave for today is uh, Building a Minimal Cytoskeleton for Synthetic Cells. So what I plan to do is tell you a little bit about this project, ambition, dream, whatever you want to call it, that we have running with a consortium of people in the Netherlands, but also, uh, which is called BASIC, Building a Synthetic Cell. It's actually uh, a program, a Dutch funded program running for 10 years where we try to make steps towards building minimal versions of uh, one, what one might call the synthetic cell. And we are having it in the cytoskeleton since many years. So I'll give a bit of a background of what we've been doing over the years and how this uh, translates in our, into our contribution to this big project. And then there's also an increasing community at the, within Europe around this kind of topic, which also has a website listed here. And as you may know, uh, also in the US, there's a build a cell community in Asia, different consortia forming. So I, something quite exciting to me. So the names that you see here uh, on slide are the people currently in my lab. So there's uh, six PhD students, a postdoc, and then a technical support. And uh, I think Cinda is here. I don't know about anybody else. And many, uh, very often, these PhD projects are actually shared uh, with other groups in the case of Cinda, together with Karsten Janke, whose name I think I also saw. Uh, but then also within this synthetic cell program, of course, we co-supervise a lot of these projects because the whole point is to try to, to integrate, to collaborate. So just um, uh, sort of as an inspiration, uh, so this is the uh, when we started this program, uh, the cartoon that we made. And as you will see later, we, we thought if we, okay, if we want to build a minimal version of something that you could call a synthetic cell or a minimal minimum of a cell. It needs at least three groups of uh, uh, enzymes, proteins that will help to do metabolism, uh, produce uh, proteins or uh, uh, other molecules that are needed for growth of the cell. Uh, we need uh, machinery to, to replicate, translate DNA, transmit information, and then a machinery to, to divide. And that's uh, where uh, the cytoskeleton may come in, although we think there's also uh, scenarios where maybe a cytoskeleton will not be needed at all, but of course that would not be my avenue. So uh, I'm sure you all know this. Uh, this this we this is a by now a quite an old movie showing that we know a lot about the molecular building blocks uh, of cells, enzymes, proteins, DNA. But uh, I think you probably would uh, agree with me that by a large extent we do not really understand yet how these different molecular machines, all these building blocks need to be put in time and space together, coordinated, organized to make life possible. Now, and on the left, you see one of my favorite uh, unicellular organisms, this from a Japanese group. So it's the fission yeast, which shows very beautifully what every living cell uh, is able to do, which is to transmit information, duplicate information, in this case in uh, form of DNA, which is enclosed in a nucleus that you see in green, grow twice as big and then uh, during one's life cycle, divide exactly once. So that's sort of the inspiration. Uh, can we, with all the knowledge we now have about uh, individual building blocks, our ability to reconstitute some of the biological function of these building blocks, uh, can we get to a, a mimic a minimal version uh, of, uh, of an enclosed artificial system that is able to do that? Uh, have some kind of uh, metabolism, produce some kind of energy molecules and other um, macromolecular machines, uh, transmit information in the form of DNA and then uh, divide exactly once. And when we put this program together, we, we sort of had these three requirements and we still have them because, of course, we're not there yet. Uh, and if you think about life, of course, you could argue that that's not enough, that you also need interaction with the outside world, that you need the ability to evolve. So. Uh, there's many ways you could think about this uh, uh, this task and uh, within the bigger community, different people take different approaches, but we decided to focus uh, on uh, what is needed minimally to, to you know, produce molecules, transmit information and divide. 
And that's what I already said. That's where this uh, sort of extremely naive and simplistic cartoon comes from. Now, if you think about uh, the sort of the simplest form of a synthetic cell, and it's maybe good to emphasize that uh, we're not aiming to to rebuild uh, or in, in any closer pre, uh, proximity uh, uh, or approximation, a real cell, like a, a bacterial cell or a yeast cell in this case, that's not the aim. We just want to uh, find ways to reproduce the, the, the minimal functions. And I just uh, sort of summarized it in three groups of, of or three types of functions, but even then uh, it's quite a daunting task uh, because uh, uh, no matter how much you try to limit it, all these uh, different aspects that are in these clouds here, you somehow have to uh, to worry about. So uh, I want to take a big step back, and this is what we've actually been doing in the last years uh, in my own group. So we've had a long interest uh, in the cytoskeleton, and not so much uh, focused on, uh, on, on simple cellular organisms like bacteria, but on uh, eukaryotic cells, where we know that the cytoskeleton and our focus has been on the microtubule cytoskeleton uh, has a big role to play in the spatial organization uh, and spatial temporal organization of cells. And the classic example, of course, uh, is the spindle uh, that is built from dynamic force generating microtubules, um, which are um, capable of uh, dividing uh, the chromosomes precisely during cell division. And somehow our synthetic cell will have also this task of uh, separating uh, genetic material towards the uh, two daughter cells. We don't think it has to be as precise as these eukaryotic cells can, uh, but this is sort of where our, um, uh, yeah, our expertise, our methodology comes from. So we've in the past uh, built, and I'll, I'll give you sort of the, the kind of ex experiments we've been developing, uh, try to build functional complexity with uh, a dynamic microtubule cytoskeleton so far mostly um, uh, inspired by uh, eukaryotic uh, uh, cytoskeletal processes. So the uh, building minimal spindles, and I'll, I'll show a bit more of detail in a second in microfluidic droplets, but we've also had an interest, and I will not talk about it at all, in what do you minimally require to set up uh, microtubule-based cell polarity, as is, for example, seen in a growing fish and yeast cell. So uh, you see in each case uh, cells uh, uh, sort of the real thing with the cytoskeleton either in green or red and then at the bottom uh, our minimal versions of that uh, in uh, using microfluidic droplets and enclosing uh, minimal cytoskeletal systems so like i said uh, the kind of uh, experiments uh, we've been doing for many years is to reconstitute step by step uh, what uh, what the cytoskeleton does, and first is the uh, reconstitute and reproduce the dynamic properties. And each case in this slide, you see the uh, what's happening in a cell, uh, and and often these movies come from Anna Akmanova's lab, with whom we collaborate a lot. So the fact that you can reconstitute the dynamic behavior of microtubules, dynamic instability, the fact that it spontaneously uh, alternates between growth and shrinkage has been possible, of course, already since the 80s, even when uh, ever since Timmichsen and Mark Kishner discovered it. And this is just a more recent version of it uh, uh, using turf microscopy. So at the basis of everything uh, a dynamic microtubule cytoskeleton can do is this uh, behavior, which we can study in all kinds of uh, detail. We're also very interested, have been very interested in, uh, if you have such an individual dynamic filament, uh, it can uh, generate forces either by growing, and this is what you see in the top in a fission yeast cell again, where microtubules that are attached uh, with their uh, minus end or nucleation site, you could say at the um, nuclear membrane, which is not visible in this uh, cell, or in this movie, I should say, uh, these microtubules grow towards the cell ends, and then when they reach the cell end, they uh, continue to grow and thereby generate a pushing force, which is transmitted to the nucleus, and that keeps uh, the nucleus in the middle. And this ability to generate pushing forces uh, is when I first started my lab, uh, even as a postdoc, uh, I've been, uh, we've been studying. So you see at the bottom uh, an in vitro reconstitution experiment of a microtubule growing against a microfabricated barrier and then uh, as you see the filament bending and that's the signature of the force being produced which can be measured very precisely using these kind of experiments and the the DIC image at the bottom is from my very first PhD student now many years ago 
And actually the, the fluorescent version of it is, is a very recent PhD student because we keep coming back uh, to this essay and I'll show you in a second why. So then that's uh, reconstituting the basic um, uh, uh, abilities uh, for dynamics and force generation. What I'm not showing is that shrinking filaments can also generate pulling forces. And this is relevant, for example, during uh, an phase when shrinking filaments pull chromosomes towards the daughter cells. And it's something that we may want to uh, uh, take advantage of also in our synthetic cell uh, system. And these pulling forces can also be measured uh, uh, other groups, and we have done that, for example, using optical tweezers. So we know quite a bit about uh, the biophysical properties and dynamic properties of these filaments. Eventually, uh, we're interested in knowing how this then contributes to the spatial organization of the cytoskeleton and, the, the, and, for example, the ability to separate chromosomes in a confined space. So this is where we start to make small steps towards artificial confinement, which is part of what our synthetic cell system will have in the end. And uh, recently and increasingly, and I think for our uh, synthetic cell project also very important, uh, we would like to add molecular control. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, the, uh, the microtubule cytoskeleton has intrinsic dynamic properties, but this is heavily regulated by a whole zoo of proteins uh, including proteins that specifically interact with the growing ends of microtubules. Uh, these end binding proteins where Anna's lab is really an expert, uh, they allow these dynamic filaments to hook up to structures like the kinetochores on chromosomes or uh, the periphery of the cell, like in, a, in, a, a, in, a, in a, like in the C. elegans embryo that you see on the left. Uh, but not only does it do these proteins allow connections to be made between dynamic filaments and other structures in the cells. Uh, they also uh, provide a way of uh, controlling the dynamic properties. How often do filaments switch between growing and shrinking? And that affects uh, the average length, for example, uh, of the filaments, which is a very important way of switching an interface cell where the microtubules are quite long towards a mitotic cell uh, where the microtubules need to be shorter and position the chromosomes in the middle of the cell. So what you see at the bottom right movie is that also in these reconstituted experiments where we enclose in this case uh, a single microtubule ester. So it's a, a centrosome nucleating microtubules in all directions towards the periphery of these droplets. Uh, you can add these control molecules. In this case, it's a EB3 and binding protein 3, uh, again in collaboration with Anna where uh, the, the, the presence of these molecules uh, makes the filaments way more dynamic. So slowly by, by controlling and understanding the mechanical properties and combining with uh, molecular control uh, in these confined spaces, we're trying to build uh, minimal versions uh, of something that we can uh, use either to understand how cell uh, division or the, the mitotic spindle organization works in eukaryotic cells, but also as an inspirational source for our uh, synthetic cell project. Okay, I just want to take one step back because uh, this is uh, this building, this complexity, and going to confined spaces is uh, is what sort of our main uh, driver, let's say. But we also try to still use these uh, biophysical experiments to understand how, for example, end binding proteins exactly interact with the ends of microtubules that, and how this is affected in the presence of force. So I'm going through it a bit quickly, but uh, and this is a, a recent example, uh, as I said in the beginning, a recent PhD student, Maurits Koch, who actually went back to our uh, buckling experiments, as we call them, uh, and did redid all these experiments in the presence of end binding proteins. So, uh, this is for the moment on BioArchive, if you want to look at the details, but what we can do in these experiments, so we, we make microfabricated uh, structures where we uh, make an effort uh, to have a sort of optical properties near the barrier where the microtubule hits the glass wall, where that we can also do a, a sort of yeah, a decent uh, turf uh, fluorescent microscopy, and then study how when a single microtubule hits a barrier, a force is generated, which uh, if, the uh, if the filament is short enough, will lead to stalling of the filament. So it's no longer able to grow because of the force that needs to be generated. And then we can correlate the behavior of the end binding protein 
uh, with the stalling behavior of the filament. And for example, look in detail how in the presence of force, um, uh, switching to shrinking happens in relation to the moment that the end binding protein uh, uh, disappears at the end. So for those who know uh, end binding protein, like EB3, they interact with growing filaments uh, in a way that is related to the uh, GTP hydrolysis state of the end of the microtubule. And we can really sort of use the EB binding here as a, as a signature of what's happening to the nucleotide states of the filament right before and after catastrophes. And the other uh, direction we have been to is to look at these structures in even more uh, um, sort of molecular resolution. So together with, uh, uh, this is actually work of three recent postdocs in the lab who are no longer there in collaboration with Arjen Jacobi, who is a cryo ET uh, microscopist um, uh, in our department. We've also asked questions like, okay, what if you have a complex of molecules, not just EB, and in this case, it was about uh, uh, yeast proteins that form molecular complex. Can we also learn a bit more on how these uh, complexes uh, uh, interact with each other, or in other words, what's the architecture of these complexes at microtubule ends? Uh, this we have not done in the presence of uh, barriers yet, maybe we could, uh, but we've noticed that if you put small amount of crowding agents, uh, then you can, can really get these large droplets or whatever you want to call them, uh, um, um, uh, large complexes, multi-protein complexes at the ends of microtubules, and we are also using, and this is the work of Vladimir Volkov, who just started his own lab at Queen Mary in the University of London. Um, and, and using cryo-ET, we are also trying to get more insight in what is exactly the molecular architecture of these apparently quite uh, yeah, disordered complexes at the ends of microtubules. And then, of course, at the end of the day, would like to also understand how that relates to bio their biological function. Okay, I just wanted to show this uh, for if you're interested, because it's a direction um, that in the future we would also still like to pursue and also still looking for people to do this kind of work uh, with us in addition to going to this uh, synthetic cell questions. So to get back to that, uh, so the, this is just for those who are not familiar with the techniques uh, to make artificial confinement we use microfluidic techniques like many other people do. It's quite a convenient method. In the past, we used uh, uh, microfabrication to do this, which was much more difficult actually. So this is better. Uh, and uh, you can just push uh, small bubbles of buffer that where you can put proteins and to some whatever you need in there into an oil phase and then have lipids there that make a monolayer. Uh, at the boundary, and this is a very convenient way to make in a controlled way um, bubbles or containers, whatever you want to call them, in the order of 10, 15 micrometers. Um, so this is what we've used to, uh, to make uh, sort of what we call minimal spindles so far based on eukaryotic microtubules. So this is uh, one of the examples of what we got if you put a single, sorry, double esters in a confined space, and, uh, and you put uh, molecular motors, I didn't emphasize, but we can put molecular motors at the periphery of these uh, droplets in analogy to what you find, for example, uh, in C. elegans spindle, and then show that the combination of pulling and pushing forces that gen are generated at the periphery of these uh, droplets, together with steric forces between these two esters, very readily give you the, uh, the spindle-like structure that we know so well from real cells. And, like I said, the, it's never the point to exactly reproduce what's happening in a real cell, but to use this minimal system in this case to learn something about the force balance and how it can be disrupted or affected by uh, other proteins. So the, uh, I'm not showing that either, but uh, one of the students in the lab is now making minimal versions of, uh, uh, well, not really chromosomes, but objects that can interact with the ends of microtubules and see if we can organize them to the middle of these kind of minimal spindles uh, to, to make a next step in this pro project. Um, like I said, um, and that's uh, one interest, but then we can, these, these same droplets that naturally form sphericals, uh, three-dimensional structures, you can also force them into what we call uh, microfluidic devices that impose a certain shape 
Uh, and in this case, at the bottom, you see also, again, a microfluidic droplet. But in this case, it's not a spherical droplet. It's actually an elongated droplet, roughly the size and shape of a fish and yeast cell that you um, can force into this shape in a microfluidic device. And then study, for example, how N-binding proteins can be delivered specifically to the ends of such structures by dynamic microtubules, as is observed in polarizing fish and yeast cells. So I think I have uh, maybe five minutes left to go back uh, to this project because uh, that's all in the past. And even though we are still very motivated and interested in uh, building uh, more complex uh, eukaryotic spindles, we also would like to think about how to use this type of techniques in the synthetic cell project that we're doing uh, together with our colleagues. And for that, we have uh, 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 slightly different requirements. So the, the, this is a bit a schematic picture, but what we envision is that within this project, uh, we will be working with uh, probably elongated uh, shapes, maybe a bit like fission yeast or bacteria, depending on the size it will eventually have. And one requirement is that in this system, uh, we will not want to add proteins ourselves, but uh, as our colleagues are working, for example, with the PURE system, um, which some of you may be familiar with, which is a, an in vitro system that allows you to translate proteins uh, from a, a DNA code. So you put a plasmid into a vesicle, and then with this system, you, um, um, you express proteins from that. And the cytoskeleton we will want to be built for this uh, synthetic cell project needs to be, uh, uh, it needs to be possible to express it in pure. And that's not possible for eukaryotic tubulin. And so we, as I will show in a second, we're uh, switching to a prokaryotic uh, cytoskeletal uh, systems. And uh, what we would like to try is to, uh, again, there will be others in the project uh, working on ways to replicate uh, DNA. Uh, and, and that could be in the form of uh, plasmids, for example. And uh, our idea is that we then have to have a minimal cytoskeletal system. It doesn't need to be spindle shaped, but it could be uh, just free filaments that align spontaneously in these elongated shapes uh, that can hook up to DNA and then either by growing or shrinking, pushing or pulling, uh, put uh, these pieces of DNA at the ends of elongating uh, vesicles. This, like I said, figure is fairly vague on purpose because we're for the moment keeping different possibilities uh, open. And what we would uh, in addition like is to have some kind of a cell cycle control. And, you know, sometime in the future, maybe this will be based on, um, uh, on biochemical machinery. But uh, as a first um, uh, step, uh, we would already be happy if we find a way to control the connection between the DNA and these uh, dynamic filaments using, for example, optocontrol techniques where we, by turning on light and on and off, we can hook up the, the DNA to the filaments or not. And that way, uh, have a way of initially externally imposing some kind of a cell cycle. So uh, uh, none of this is working yet, but we're sort of like we've done in the past with the eukaryotic cytoskeleton, trying to build piece by piece uh, this kind of uh, systems. So let me show you what Marilyn, does about work. three minutes left. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, so as I said, we, one of the things we are exploring is, um, is uh, bacterial tubulin. So bacterial tubulin AB. This is a homolog from eukaryotic tubulin that uh, has been published. Uh, forms dynamic filaments very similar to eukaryotic microtubules there. Uh, only four or five protofilaments instead of 13. But uh, as you see in the middle, this is um, a work by Reza Amini, who just finished his uh, PhD uh, a few weeks ago, uh, showing that dynamic instability in a reconstituted system can be reproduced. And he also showed that if you put these filaments against walls, that forces can be generated. So very similar to eukaryotic microtubules. And very importantly, uh, together with the group of Christophe Dananon, who is a colleague of mine in Delft and also partner in the basic program, uh, we've shown that this protein actually can be expressed in the pure system. So if you take a liposome, and that's what you see here at the bottom, um, and you put a DNA encoding for this uh, uh, cytoskeletal proteins uh, within the liposome together with the pure system, then 
functional uh, B-top AB proteins will be expressed. And you see at the bottom that they will also form filaments, which are then uh, able to deform the membrane. So this is a first step. Um, and what, we, what is not working yet here is the connection to DNA. And actually we have some doubts whether that will ever work. So we are not only focusing on this bacterial uh, 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 tubulins, uh, but for example, also uh, exploring uh, uh, optical control of a PAR and RC system, which is more like actin. So we're in the phase where we have now uh, the other system we're looking at, uh, which I'm not showing is FUSI. This is a um, coming from a bacteriophage um, encoded uh, tubulin-like protein. So we're uh, exploring the possibilities of all these uh, different prokaryotic systems, always asking, can we uh, find a way to hook it up to DNA in a way that can be controlled with light? And uh, will this be uh, expressible in the pure system? Uh, and the, the way it's going right now that we're also thinking about hybrid systems because uh, we don't need to necessarily take a, uh, a complete system like uh, where the DNA, the linker protein and the filament are all coming from the same species, because if we use light to make the connection, for example, using eyelid and SSPB, there's nothing against uh, using uh, um, sort of hybrid systems. And that's uh, what we are currently working on. So I think uh, that's where I'll stop. I, I, I already said this is part of a bigger program. So we have specialists in all these different aspects of the synthetic cell. And just to give you an idea of you know, how we think about this, pieces of everything we want to do are working. And we've just made sort of a roadmap like this where we are allowing ourselves uh, to really take shortcuts uh, so that we, we're, we're not only pursuing uh, precise uh, symmetric division, but we will be happy with asymmetric division. We will be happy with multiple plasmids um, dividing randomly. Uh, and then uh, at some later steps, uh, uh, we'll be only be happy maybe with symmetric divisions where we have bigger chromosomes where that we split exactly into two. It's a bit full slide, but just to give you an idea how in this consortium we're thinking about the different paths uh, towards uh, success. And then uh, the, the really protein-based system that also allows a cell division, which means that pinching off of two cells is a molecularly the most challenging one so far. Uh, so we've defined different levels of autonomy and somewhere in this whole scheme is also the, um, the, the aim to use active processes like we are working on uh, to segregate DNA, but that's uh, hidden here, our contribution. But others uh, in the, are also using um, passive mechanisms for DNA segregation. So like I said in the beginning, it's not a necessity that our first success in the end will, will involve a cytoskeleton, but that's for sure the contribution that we are trying to make. I'll stop here. Thank uh, the people that we collaborate with or have collaborated with uh, in the past on many aspects of the experiments we do. It's always a huge pleasure and the funding agencies, and most importantly, of course, the group. So this is a picture in the Rijksmuseum. If you've been there in Amsterdam, it's the night watch there in the back. And this was the first time as a group after the pandemic and that we could actually go out together. So that's why we're all smiling, uh, like you see here. I hope that gave an impression of uh, sort of what's going on in our minds. And uh, thanks very, very much for, for listening. Thank you very much for that uh, for that beautiful talk. We can do our Zoom clapping. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, feel free to put questions in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question now. Um, we have a, a time for a, a question or two right now, if you'd like. Should I stop the share or keep it? Uh... Um, you, can, you can leave it for another minute or so. Uh, hi, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there was a slide where uh, there was a microfluidic chamber and uh, there was a video of the droplets with the system in, inside it. So I wanted to know how exactly, uh, what is the composition of that uh, system? Is it water in oil or oil in water? Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, so I, I you're, uh, sorry. Yeah, this one. Why? Yeah, just trying, okay. Yeah, I went over it, of course, very quickly without giving you a lot of detail. And uh, so you're right. So what is happening here is that um, 
This is a microfluidic device where we control pressure on the different inlets. And on the left of this movie, there's three inlets. The, the one com coming from top and bottom is oil with lipids. And the one coming from the left is buffer. And the buffer includes, uh, uh, in, in this, uh, this particular experiment, what you see on the upper right, uh, it's uh, just a microtubule, tubulin buffer uh, with uh, tubulin protein centrosomes. Uh, in this case, on, on the edge, there's a green um, uh, uh, dynein molecule, because here we're looking at how dynein molecules together with dynamic filaments generate pooling forces on these esters. So the inside is buffer and water and whatever we need in there. And the outside is oil and the interface uh, is a lipid, although it's a bit... Um, so the lipid, I should say, can be functionalized. And that's, for example, how we put motor proteins there specifically, but also other proteins we've put specifically at the interface. It's a, it's a bit misleading because, in fact, to keep these droplets stable so that they don't all fuse together, which is what they should do eh, if uh, yeah, water... Yeah. And, uh, there's a lot of soap there as well. Yeah. So like okay. Span 80, for example, and that keeps them stable. Uh, and, and one of the problems is to, to so we always need a lot of um, also blocking agents like uh, BSA or casein be, to, to prevent uh, proteins from sticking at this interface, which can also uh, easily uh, happen. And the other thing that's important to, is to use oxygen scavengers because once everything is bleached in here, there's no refreshment of anything. So you have to really be careful for bleaching as well uh, and sticking to the interface. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. 